Sounds good. So, all right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on GDPR for your WordPress powered online course membership site. We've got a special guest, Leo, and then we have Thomas from Lift LMS is with us today. Leo, can you tell us a little bit about you and where you come from and your relationship with GDPR before we get started here? Sure. Uh, my name is Leo. I work for a company called XWP. We're a WordPress VIP agency. We solve problems at enterprise scale for WordPress companies and publishers and e-commerce sites and all kinds of fun, messy, big, uh, wild places. Um, I'm also a co-organizer with Thomas uh, for the WordCamp Los Angeles uh, 2018, which is coming up in just a few months. Um, and yeah, I, I really, really care about GDPR. Um, most people have no idea what it is and how it affects them. Uh, and more to the point, uh, no one really understands how data privacy matters, especially here stateside in the United States. Um, and I, I, I realized a few months into learning about GDPR, this was back in like October last year, that no one was really doing anything to get the word out. So uh, I started uh, doing a ton of research. I found out that WordPress core had a couple of efforts, uh, as well as a couple of developers who have since launched their own plugins around GDPR, um, marching toward the May 25th deadline, which is Friday. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming uh, on, on the, this webinar during this busy week for GDPR. Um, so for everybody listening, I just want to welcome the attendees. We've got Amy, Hell, Mark, another Mark, Michelle, Paulo, Ruben, Tim, Tom, Vincent, and more people will be joining us. Uh, if you guys would, let us know where you're calling in from on the chat. See which ones of you are in Europe or in the stateside or where you're at. Hello from London. Awesome. Um, so just a little bit on the format of this webinar. Uh, Leo's got a presentation about kind of GDPR in general, and we're going to dig into that. Uh, he's going to take questions as we go. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature. Um, that's probably the best place to ask your questions. Uh, you can also ask them in chat. And there's a feature here in Zoom where you can raise your hand if you um, want to talk live. So we can do all of that. Um, this is being recorded, so we are going to have a replay available. So that'll go out if you registered for this. Um, if you're watching this on Facebook, uh, feel free to jump on over here into the Zoom if you want to be kind of more involved with the live audience we have over here. And so Leah's going to go first, and then Thomas is going to get into the Lifter LMS specific side of things. We're going to have kind of a demo of what it's like and take some more questions. But thank you everybody for coming. And uh, hello, we've got people from Jerusalem, Paris, California. Awesome. Cool. Well, I'll hand it over to you, Leo. Uh, take us to school on GDPR. All right, we all ready? <laughs> so I, uh, I really don't like the current narrative around data privacy. Ooh, nope, let's not do that. Let's present my screen. Can you all see my screen? We've got it. Perfect. So um, first of all, I, I have to tell you to brace yourself. GDPR is coming <laughs> just a few days away. It's scary, just like winter. It will be here before you know it. Um, me, this is me. I'm a consultant for XWP. I'm a stuff maker and problem solver. I have a background in journalism. I've worked for media agencies. I've worked in education for a very long time. Uh, I've worked with WordPress for a very, very long time, and uh, I'm an organizer for a bunch of things. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of the uh, introduction, I'm, a, I'm an organizer for WordCamp Los Angeles, or an organizer for WordCamp Orange County. Uh, I'm actually also a organizer for the Los Angeles WordPress meetup group, and we actually have a meetup tonight here in Long Beach, uh, where we'll be talking about WooCommerce, uh, among other things, uh, also SaaS and uh, Gutenberg and all that fun stuff. And uh, one of the things that you'll find is that I generally try my best to to care deeply about the things that I can affect. Um, and in, in relationship to GDPR, uh, we've been researching for our clients, trying to understand the best way forward. Um, I've personally been contributing to WordPress core. Uh, I mentioned as well, I've also been doing a lot of uh, presentations on GDPR. I've actually got two more coming up, uh, one next week uh, in Santa Monica, one down in Orange County for the JavaScript LA community. So this is also something that goes beyond just WordPress. Um, GDPR is a really, really important topic. Um, I'm a consumer of craft coffee, and I'm also not a lawyer. Um, my friend Brendan, who's over on the right, is a colleague of mine who also works at XWP. Um, and he's out of Australia. He is also not a lawyer. He helped me do parts of this presentation, so I wanted to make sure to give him some props at the very top of the deck. 
All right, so this is my first chart, and this is my favorite chart uh, of all the things we're going to talk about today, because this, this sets the, the pace, I think, in a way that probably should scare you. Um, and that's not what I'm trying to do, but, you know, it should probably give you some context to where we are in the world of things. So this was done back in 2016, and at that time, 62% of people in France and 48%, only 48% of Americans thought com uh, com that companies were not being honest about their data use. Uh, this was before the Equifax breach. This was before the, the, the Target breach. This was before the Home Depot breach. This is before the Cambridge Analytica scandal. This is before all of that stuff. So at that point, about half of the companies be believed, or half the people believed that the companies were misusing their data. At the same time, only about a, a quarter of most of Europe had believed that the United States had been doing the things correctly. And at the same time, uh, the European Union saw this and said it was time to do something a little bit more elegantly, a little bit more directly, a little bit more principled in a way to maybe manage these things together. Their solution was something called GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which uh, is a new regulation, which is an addendum and overhaul of the existing data privacy laws. Um, it's actually not that very different. It's really just a cleaner version of things that already exist and, and one that has a little bit more enforcement built into the things that are actually existing. Um, for those of you that are familiar with the current cookie laws that have been around for a long time, so the e-cookie the e privacy directive, this is in addition to all of that. And we know that the cookie law is actually going to be overhauled soon. And GDPR, of course, goes into force just a couple days from now on Friday. Would you mind uh, just a quick primer on what the cookie law is? So the cookie law, uh, the cookie law requires you to, uh, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, requires you to request for consent before placing a cookie on a user's browser. Um, and if you use that cookie in any other ways that they wouldn't necessarily know, you actually have to tell them that. So typically there's a prompt that might come up on your web browser that says, hey, you agree to use the site. Uh, in agreeing to use the site, you should probably click on this button. If you do that, you give us some data, but in, the, in exchange, we give you some deeper services. So typically you might use this for uh, embed scripts or commenting or some other type of uh, real-time processing information. So, and that also might be things for analytics or advertising. Uh, it could be a variety of factors. And so typically cookies tend to be a very important topic because that is a specific version of, uh, of information about a given user. Awesome, thank you. So GDPR, what, 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 are, what are we doing here? Well, we wanna do things better. We want users to trust us more. We want less vulnerabilities by default. And we want breaches to not be so bad and not so often. Um, and I look at this as a major opportunity industry-wide for businesses to reduce their data and legal exposure. Um, especially for us here as XWP, we're an agency. We, we believe it's something that can help us uh, give an, another opportunity for uh, helping our clients navigate this. Uh, and I think in the case of Lifter LMS, uh, Lifter LMS believes that they can help your, you uh, navigate this. Um, but really the, the reasoning that I stand behind and the reason why I'm so excited to be part of the community trying to help solve this issue is that it's an opportunity for all of us to do privacy better. Um, I, I look at this and I have to say the very first thing you should take away from here is that you should be designing for privacy uh, architecturally and infrastructurally. That everything that you do from here on out should be done with privacy in mind. And privacy is a principle. It's not necessarily an end result. Privacy is the thing that is leading you and what you're doing. And if you're designing for privacy, you might as well also design with ethics in mind too. Since the ethics are really the thing that, that correlate to all the things that we're doing. Uh, one of my good friends who is a member of the WordPress community, uh, Morton Ren Hendrickson, uh, who works for LinkedIn Learning, uh, recently published an article with Smashing Mag Magazine that gets into the, all the ethics behind web design. And he says, making ethics part of our design process helps us build the world we all want to live in. And I look at that and I say, this is why GDPR matters. This is why getting behind this stuff matters. This is why removing some of our data points, maybe reducing sales sometimes, maybe reducing conversions sometimes, but ultimately leading to a better long-term trust. That's the kind of stuff that's gonna give you the, the happiest version of, of your site. So GDPR, this is the number that you're gonna hear every single time someone talk about it. And, and I'm gonna call it out because it's what people tend to talk about, but I actually don't think this is the thing that matters the most. This is why you might feel the financial pressure of, of why you should comply. And it's 4% of gross domestic output or two, 20 million euro, whatever is greater. 
So they could come after you and say, you owe us 4% of your global output or 20 million euro. This means that if you have a really severe data breach of information you weren't supposed to be collecting or processing, and it directly impacts your users under the most, you know, uh, most extreme situation, you could face very serious punishments. If you're like me, uh, the first time you heard that, you were like, wow, that's a real, real scary thing. But in short, all this means is we want you to be a good data steward. We want you to respond to the things that come with lots of caution, right? We know that you're not supposed to be collecting data. We knew that all along. Uh, in fact, here in the United States, we've had multiple laws uh, and multiple practices by the, the Federal Trade Commission that actually require you to do this anyway. So um, I look at this and I say, being a good data steward is a thing you should be doing anyway. You should be ethical. You should be approaching these things with the least amount of problems to begin with. If you were to take away a single slide from this entire talk or take a screenshot, this is the one that I would do it for. So your TL TLDR, your too long didn't read on GDPR, which you probably should read. It's 200 pages, it's super scary sounding, but it's really not that bad. This is your summary that you need to take home and, and live and think through and, and try to apply to everything that you're doing. Don't get data without consent. Don't have data without consent. Don't give data to someone else without consent. Don't use data without consent. Don't lose data, especially sensitive data. And if you lose data, you need to tell people. That's really all GDPR does. And it seems to me like it's pretty straightforward. No, you know, you're basically asking people to handle things in a way that it should be handled. Uh, I also look at personal, personal data here as, as something that needs to be defined. Um, so personal data in the most limited definition says it's any information, or sorry, the most broad definition says any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. What, uh, what they refer to as a data subject. This means an identifiable natural person is one that can be identified directly or indirectly, whether that's through a name, an ID number, location data, an email address, cookie, an IP address, which is new with GDPR, uh, or any other online identifier, uh, especially things that might be uh, involving physical location, physiological uh, data, genetic data, mental data, economic data. Um, and even sometimes anonymized data or pseudo anonymized data where you might be parsing that data into like a unique cookie or something that might still be a version of personal data. What's really, really sensitive that you really have to be careful about is racial or ethnic origin data, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, health data, sex life or sexual orientation, past or expunged criminal, criminal convictions. It's also kind of interesting because as we get into this, actually before we get there, I, I wanna talk about indirect data. So sometimes people think about this data in the, in the most direct state. You're like, well, I don't necessarily collect uh, religious data or biometric data on my site. You know, I do, I'm running events or something. Well, sometimes this might also be collected indirectly. For example, if I ask Thomas, what's your t-shirt size? All of a sudden I now have metrics on his biometric uh, construction. And that is technically a form of health data. Or if I ask Chris here, uh, what's your meal preference? You know, do you, do you eat kosher? I, I might now have your religious or philosophical belief uh, stored in my data set. So this is one of those things that like, it becomes harder to understand. Um, but I wanna spend some time focusing around uh, processing data since this is actually one that most people have a harder time understanding. And to me, I actually think is really interesting, especially because it talks about a, a larger problem within the context of GDPR. So, what is processing? Well, it's robots. Y'all with me here? I hope you're all with me. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about personal data and techniques that personal data might be used. Uh, and you might be using this already uh, in ways that go beyond just a WordPress site. You have things like direct business communication. You might be emailing someone, you might be using a CRM, you might have marketing tools that go beyond your website, whether that's uh, with something like Facebook or MailChimp. You might have remarketing tools, uh, maybe through Google or Facebook, especially things like lookalike targeting and profiling. So this personal data does all kinds of things, but you have some responsibilities that you have to remember that you as a website owner and, or an admin uh, or as a user, you collect and use data all day long. Uh, and as a website uh, director, you actually design these interfaces to collect and interact with that data. Um, and sometimes you're collecting things indirectly that you may not be aware of and you may not necessarily see as serious, but it might actually be serious. 
And, and the one question that you have to be asking again and again and again, do you know what's there? Do you know what's in your database? Uh, and I, I actually advocate now quite a bit for doing a privacy impact assessment, which is a longer version of an audit. What we're asking here is, do you know, and have you found out, have you re reported it somewhere internally to say, this is what's actually on my website? And, you know, I, I look at personal data and I say, it's, it's good to collect this because it can make your services more convenient. Um, having targeted data can be helpful. Uh, in the case of social networks, for example, it can help you make friends, it can help you find your old friends or colleagues or partners, it can help you make a purchase or make another purchase. Um, but sometimes it can also be about influencing behavior. Um, and this is a question we're about to dive into a little bit more deeply. Um, and advertisers in this case could be a, a company or a political group, and it may be actually influencing your behavior in ways that you may not agree with. So for example, returning purchases. Uh, if you make a purchase, you may not necessarily want to make the second purchase. It's important to understand that not all users care about making that, that upcharge. And as a business owner, you're constantly trying to double or triple your sales. You want to grow your business. Um, but sometimes that can be subversive to the way users see the platform itself. Uh, another example here is sometimes you might be inflating your ratings. If you just ask your users every single time for the best ratings, um, they aren't necessarily going to be really rating the product in, in a way that uh, is honest about your, your service or your product. Uh, there's also the conversation around changing opinions. If you misuse data or use data in other ways that uh, is subversive, you might actually be changing opinions of your users and having a hard time gauging what's actually true about the, about the service itself. Uh, my favorite quote around this conversation is from my friend Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, and Napoleon says that war is 90% information, which of course leads me to a very important and very touchy topic uh, around Cambridge Analytica. Um, and this slide's a little bit old, it's actually 89 million now, data of 89 million Facebook users in the United States uh, had their information compromised. Uh, and this included names, phone numbers, email addresses, activity, location history, as well as all of their networks information. Uh, and this, this is a really, really complicated subject. Uh, and I know that, for example, I was one of those people who had their data leaked, uh, possibly through my network. I probably didn't opt into the original survey that, that they requested. And that information went on to be used in ways that were very, very important in uh, influencing elections in Argentina, the United Kingdom, the Czech Republic, Kenya, India, Nigeria, St. Kitts and Nevis, and here in the United States, the 2016 election. And it leads us to an important conversation. It says personal data is sensitive, and you have to recognize that personal data is sensitive. Um, There's some great questions here around consent, uh, around use, uh, around opting out. Um, for example, Uber talked about how it didn't, didn't collect users. And it took a long back and forth over about two years to finally have Uber finally say they were going to stop tracking their users after they're driving their users off. Even worse, they were tracking users who didn't have the app installed anymore, who'd uninstalled the app. Equifax, of course, had about half the United States credit reports leaked uh, last year, which was a really, really big, scary story. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, Every single person who ever has had a Yahoo account, for those of you who are tuning in, has had their, uh, has had their data breached. And some of that data contains really sensitive information, as well as Target with its credit card processing, Home Depot with a similar story. Sony PlayStation had a major hack a while ago. The United States uh, Office of Personal Management had leaked out a ton of uh, information about government employees, including spies who had personal information with names, information. It gets into some of the large questions here, right? Where, where should we be collecting information? How, how closely related should all the information be? And how, you know, we have to understand that data is extremely sensitive and misused. It can be, it can be very, very dangerous. We've got a question, Leo, about how this would affect a project if we're doing remarketing. So what should well, we think about? Let's say I have an online course and I'm doing, uh, you know, I'm dropping a Facebook pixel and re retargeting and remarketing. Like, what should, how should I even think about that in the terms of GDPR? That's a really good question. Uh, and I'm going to save my answer until we get to the slide about explicit consent. Because I okay. actually have a, good, I have a good, good answer. But first, I want to address the elephant in the room. Can you all see the elephant? <laughs> he's, he's cute. He's a little baby. So, so the, the one thing that people have a hard time grappling with is, uh, especially here in the United States, is that 
that GDPR may not apply to them. Um, and I'm, of course, based here in the United States, um, and I care about this topic, and, and actually affects people in a similar way all across the world, not just here in the United States. Any, uh, any company collecting the process or, or, or processing the personal data of data subjects who are in the union have to be aware of extraterritoriality. So here in the United States, we actually have agreements with the European Union in place to uh, process extraterritorial, extraterritoriality uh, as it relates to jurisprudence. Meaning it doesn't matter where your company is located or the nationality of the persons, your subjects themselves may be uh, subject to GDPR levels of understanding. So if you, if you are concerned around this question, uh, if you think that you may not qualify under GDPR coverage, you should probably understand this. And this is a slide that I would say that if you feel like you're in the maybe or no category, definitely talk to a lawyer, definitely talk to someone who gives you legal advice. I'm not a lawyer and I can't give you specific advice, but I can give you what I've seen to be true based on uh, the business world around me. If you are definitely in the EU, or if you're selling or targeting or processing EU resident data, you need to understand the rights and responsibilities of your users. If you actively block EU traffic, if you uh, have nothing to do with the EU and you avoid EU-based clients, or you don't collect data at all, and you somehow manage to do all of that, you might be able to skip out of GDPR, but that's actually extremely challenging. And that means you're cutting out you know, about half of your potential customer pool, depending on uh, what kinds of services you're looking at. Uh, most let, me, let me ask you a question that I get a lot le recently and I'm not sure how to answer it. Maybe you don't know either, but I'll just pose it to you. Sure. Um, if there is a law in the EU, how do they enforce that in the United States? That's a big, big sticky one. Um, in regards to GDPR, we don't have a good answer yet since jurisprudence has yet to play out. So precedents will set the policies moving forward. But at this point, we know that the United States and the FTC uh, and several members of the FCC as well have, have uh, bridged gaps with the EU to do this kind of work in the past. Extraterritoriality is in effect at all times. So this could mean, for example, uh, uh, potentially issues with visas. It could mean potentially issues with shipping products across state lines, or sorry, across international lines. It could mean, uh, for example, the United States allowing them to take you to court here in the United States. We don't quite know what it looks like yet based on GDPR, but there are other versions of extraterritorial, extraterritoriality in American jurisprudence. So for example, the laws that apply in Europe might apply here if we respect them. Um, there are organizations like Interpol, for example, who bridge the gap between different countries whose whole designation is this concept of extraterritoriality. It's a hard word to say more than three times in a row. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but basically, we don't quite know yet. We know that they want to do it. We know that the United States wants to comply. And generally speaking, it's best to play by the rules because it's more ethical. So regardless of whether you are required to, I believe it is better for all of us to do it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the maybe section here. Um, and depending how far you scale up, you might be in the maybe category, you might be in the, the yes category. Um, there are a lot of hobby organizations and a lot of hobby uh, sites that um, and the catch-all term might be like your, your LMS site has European users. Well, are you collecting data about them? Are you collecting and processing information about it? Did you have your users consent to that processing? Um, if you write about EU or your, your services are about the EU, for example, if you've got a travel site, uh, this is going to matter to you. You should understand whether you're, you're doing this. Uh, there's also some patchwork problems. Uh, if you have employees in the EU, uh, we don't quite understand all of the scope and size and shape to this. We believe at this point, though, it is best to take a risk-averse approach, to take a conservative approach toward data collection. And generally, you probably shouldn't have some of the data that you're collecting in the first place. Uh, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you might be collecting data in ways that are pseudo-anonymized, but uh, Google Analytics, MailChimp, and, and similar services actually require you to understand how that stuff works. And depending on what you're doing, some of the data you're collecting may not belong in that database. And if you're in violation of the terms of service or you don't necessarily include it in your privacy policy, those services could deny you access to your data in the future and they could just simply remove it. So in, in the more extreme examples, the processors themselves carry liability. And the reason why this is a problem is the European Union cares deeply about the subject. They don't want people to have data that could be problematic. 
Um, I want to get into some rights uh, that are really critical for you to understand about your users, uh, especially when it comes to what the users are asking and what WordPress has done. So users are able to now go to you and say, I would like a copy of everything that's on my sites. They call that the right to, uh, right to portability. Any data that's been collected about them, whether it's through analytics, whether it's through remarketing, whatever data that is, they can go to you and say, I want that data. So you have to understand what this means. And uh, if you're using a tool, including a complex tool like Lyft or LMS, you need to understand what that looks like. They have the right to rectification. So if, they, if you collect the data that's wrong about them and you're showing them, they should be able to correct it themselves or have some process to be able to email you and say, correct it about me. They have the right to object. This is a really, really big one. So if you have a European Union client or if you have someone who's trying to do things around remarketing, you actually have to listen and allow them to say, I don't want that to happen or I don't want processing to happen. I don't want these things collected about me. I should have an opportunity to say no. The right to know about profiling. So this is a little bit more challenging and may not necessarily matter in the LMS space, but it does matter in larger conversation around GDPR. You as a user, should have the ability to understand how your data is being used, especially as it relates to other data sets. So for example, if you're taking someone's user data and comparing it to other users, you have to tell that user who first was collecting your, your profiling data set and your user who's being compared to that profiling data set, data set that they're being profiled. Oh, uh, um, just, just a quick question there. In Lyft or LMS, like in analytics, if we're like, you know, if a, somebody's looking at what they're doing against the average or something like that, is that an example of profiling in comparison? Potentially. It, it's, it's very sticky. And yeah. uh, understanding that consent is better than not consent will generally lead you through the right principles. Um, data, when anonymized and aggregated, becomes less sensitive. Mm -hmm. But uh, understanding that small data sets have a higher level of sensitivity uh, can present challenges. So, Makes for example... Sense. If you're pulling uh, international data, um, if you're looking at uh, every user on your site and you know you have three users in the UK or you have four users in Paris, uh, if, if your analytics leads up to that, you might actually be, be able to identify who your user is accidentally through some data point that might be collected. Um, and it's really challenging to see all the auspices of how data might be risky, but I recommend having extreme sensitivity toward that data set and treating most of your data as sensitive. So just as you treat a credit card data with sensitivity or social security number with sensitivity or someone's uh, birth date with sensitivity, I recommend you treat the same thing about their email addresses and their IP addresses. Have a level of sensitivity and, and ask more care, caution here. Um, my favorite right here that I, I really love and I look forward to seeing it happen because it's gonna be really messy. Uh, is the right to be forgotten, uh, or sometimes also called the right to erasure. So this means that a user can go to your site and say, I no longer want my information to be in your site. I'm requesting you to remove everything about me across all of your services. So that means that you can't keep that data short of maybe financial data or, or required information by law that you might need to keep for other reasons if they ask for it. And so you're gonna to need to understand what this means uh, and you should be able to, to do this in a way that allows your, your company to stay within compliance externally for other reasons, whether that may be accounting reasons or whether that may be tax reasons versus your user's rights to privacy. So what this means is in practice, you could yell at your iPad and say, erase all pictures of Ron, my good friend from Parks and Recreation. And you should be like Will Smith and say, hey, don't even worry about it. So your site should just work in the background without all these things to work. Um, this probably doesn't apply to you, but I'm calling it out since it's part of the GDPR conversation. At the largest scale, uh, this is a big topic. Uh, we have something called a data protection officer that some companies actually have to hire. So if you've got lots of processing, lots of different kinds of data that you're, that's part of your site, you may need to hire a data protection officer. The vast majority of you who are tuning in today probably don't need a data protection officer because you don't think you need a data protection officer. Um, fortunately, this is the easiest one to skip over. So on to the next topic, the fun one, uh, explicit consent. So uh, there was a question earlier about remarketing data and what that looks like. Uh, I recommend that as much as you can, 
you ask for consent. And consent, consent here is defined as uh, explicit consent, which means you can't just click a box or have a box pre-clicked for you. You actually should be asking for unambiguous, specific, affirmative action. Um, that's a direct quote from Article 4, Paragraph 11, and, uh, and Recital 32 of GDPR, which means they want you to click twice to say yes. So if remarketing is so critical and core to your business, you may need to understand that your numbers may drop as a result of this with your European clients, unless you have this explicit consent saying, hey, to keep us profitable, to keep us working, I want you to do A, B, and C. You also need this explicit consent documented in your privacy policy. Um, and revoking consent, saying, hey, I'm no longer interested in you tracking this information, should be just as easy. So you need to have some place where that panel is, is useful. Uh, this is also really critical uh, as it comes to data. You have to define the scope of that data. So you can't misuse data. You can't give your data away. So uh, a really common bad practice I've seen that people use for MailChimp lists, uh, and I, I'm so happy to talk about this, is that you can no longer sell an email address list. You can no longer... Uh, take information and maybe use it for a different campaign that goes outside the scope of the collection that you'd originally specified for. Um, and this is a really, really critical detail. That means all users will have a better understanding of what their data actually does. Uh, for those of you who have European users in your data set, which is probably most of you who are tuning in, um, one thing to consider is that you might actually have GDPR in effect on something that's already, already being collected. So this may mean, depending on how that was consented, you may be able to keep that data or you may actually be required to remove it. And you have three days to figure that out. So technically, if you're holding onto data you weren't supposed to have in the first place, or if it wasn't consented correctly, or there's a privacy policy about it, you may legally be obligated to remove it and you may already be in breach of GDPR. So uh, another major responsibility that you have that you should understand is that you have to plan for breaches. This means that you have 72 hours to report to the data protection authorities about a breach for those given users. Um, it's also a responsibility to let your users know with undue delay. You have to tell your users about the information that was leaked or exposed or lost or whatever actually happened. Um, and as a result of this, it's difficult. We want you to actually understand that you should have policies and procedures way ahead of time to be able to plan for this stuff so that when a rainy day happens, you have an umbrella in the first place. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, there's a couple of changes that are really critical to understand, especially if you've talked about anything involving um, data privacy laws in the past. IP addresses and mobile IDs are now also considered to be personal data. Things that are also now included that you should be definitely aware of are things like geolocation data. So where your users are matters. Um, sensitive personal data, as we talked about earlier, involving things like health, race, and religion, political orientation data, as well as biometric data. So if you're collecting fingerprints or retina scans, genetic data, that might matter. Um, in your case, if you're managing an LMS site, you're probably not using this data, but it's still worthy to call out. But all we want you to do is to be a steward of all the data. So your data might live in a spreadsheet. I say ride the unicorn and, and feel like you understand what's actually there. Otherwise, you might get a visit from my friends here, uh, friends in suits, the lawyers. So for those of you who are tuning in, uh, who are companies, um, some questions you might want to be taking away and thinking about are, are understanding the responsibilities of controllers, so a data controller versus a data processor. A data controller is a person who actually consents that data and who's the, maybe the main company that's doing with that data. So for example, if you're running an LMS site, you've got a, an education site that you're running, you probably are the data controller. The services you work with, Facebook, MailChimp, et cetera, those would be your data processors. Uh, and sometimes you might actually be both depending on the relationship of what you do, uh, but it gets, gets messy. Defining a data scope and audience is also really critical. I recommend trying to have the least amount of data in the first place to avoid problems in the future, especially around breach and violation of regulations, but you need to define what's best for your business. Uh, and for companies whose core business is data, you definitely need to spend more than 10 minutes looking at this. GDPR is not a simple conversation. And in the hour and a half, I still feel like we're not giving this enough justice uh, today because this is a big, big topic that you need to be able to unpack and understand. For those of you who are tuning in who are developers, um, some basic topics that I really strongly recommend you understand and, and start to ask is around data and how you actually collect it for your database directly. So if you aren't already, you should be escaping and sanitizing data. 
And if you don't know what that means, you definitely need to learn what that means. And you definitely need to check for PHP coding standards and JavaScript coding standards, and to be sure that data is handled correctly, especially as it relates to your entire database. So this means that data isn't going to the wrong place, that people don't necessarily try to break into your site in the ways that you don't allow them to. And that generally, you're, you're doing things that are considered best practices industry-wide. Um, we at XWP have published our coding standards. We talk a little bit about escaping and, and sanitizing data. And I strongly recommend that, that if you have any questions, you can start looking there. Um, there's also information at the WordPress coding standards as well for developers who are interested in this topic. Uh, similar topics that you may consider doing uh, are SSL and HTTPS which is a big, big conversation. If you don't have HTTPS on your site right now, you probably are facing an SEO penalty. You're also facing a security vulnerability and you're simply doing it wrong. So understand SSL, understand what it means, especially as it relates to APIs and OAuth and all of the other topics as well. SSL is really, really big. If you're collecting sensitive data, things like credit cards, if you're selling stuff, uh, understand your encryption path. Where is your data being encrypted? Is your data being encrypted? If you've got health and biometric data, it might be it falls under the United States HIPAA or, um, or FERPA, you should definitely be asking, is this data in need of being encrypted? If it isn't encrypted and it's supposed to be, you could be facing fines that go way beyond GDPR, especially here in the United States. Uh, also, if you have APIs or you're using a third-party service on your site, you have to understand these APIs at a deep level. So for those of you who have tracking pixels, for those of you who are using Facebook, uh, anything involving Facebook or anything using Google Ad, uh, AdSense or Google Ad Tracking, or any, anything involving Google Analytics, understand what data you're giving to these partners and how they might be using it, especially on the aggregate. And in fact, uh, a really critical core responsibility is you want to understand that you need an agreement with all of these data partners. And in fact, as a developer, you should be pushing back and say, hey, I can't put this tracking script on your site unless you tell me that there is a data agreement. Um, you are the sort of first line in making sure that the data that you're collecting doesn't necessarily need to be collected in the first place. Uh, we talk a lot about publishers here at XWP, uh, and the questions we ask tend to be around uh, reader consent, uh, making sure that your readers have consented to the issues at a deep level, as well as profiling. We want to make sure that subscribers who know, should know whether they're being profiled or not. Um, we often do things with involving contests or other kinds of uh, uh, techniques to get more people involved and interested about our sites. We make sure that we have consent about that, that, data, cons uh, that, that data flow. And we want to make sure that people understand that uh, when collecting those, those submissions that we've actually given a limited scope for that data. Um, if you've got subscriptions for any kind of purpose, uh, you need to make sure that you have a consent actually identified. And tracking needs to be consented as well. Um, also really critical that many people don't quite realize as well is that when a user signs up for your forum or for your platform or for any kinds of things that they're literally giving your email address, you have to tell them what you're going to use your email address for. Any place where someone is giving you information, you have to ask this question. Does my user understand what I'm doing with their data? So you should spell it out where you're collecting that data, you should spell it out in your privacy policy, and you should simply be as above board as possible. Uh, now to talk a little bit about WordPress.org and what we're doing for GDPR. So those of you have probably seen uh, that 4.9.6 was released on Thursday morning, which is a really big deal. Um, and many of you had seen that there was a privacy policy, privacy policy builder that we included as part of the release. We also included the right to be forgotten and the right to portability, which means you can now export a user's history out of your WordPress database. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, and Thomas is going to talk a little bit about this, but Lifter LMS has some integrations with this stuff, and which they're one of the first uh, plugins to do this, which is a really big deal, and I commend you guys for doing that work. Um, there's also written guidelines for admins that are partly drafted, and we're continuing to draft more, and I definitely recommend you know poking around and asking some more questions around this. Um, we also have a, a, a channel inside the make.wordpress.org community Slack, as well as uh, some, some efforts around the core channel talking about GDPR compliance. Um, and it's something that we find that is very, very important since the law is impending and soon to be real and, and very, very painful for those who don't necessarily comply uh, deeply or fully. And I, I keep saying this, but I believe it's frankly more pressing and more important than Gutenberg. So for those of you who are like, let's focus on this, I say let's focus on, on GDPR first and make sure that your ship shape, if it does apply to you. Could you elaborate uh, on what you mean by written guidelines for admins to be drafted? What does that mean? So we 
uh, on the course side have been writing about what these tools can do, uh, what users should be concerned about in terms of privacy, what site admins need to be aware of in terms of installing plugins, what plugin developers need to know in constructing their plugins, what theme developers need to know in constructing their themes, and really what does GDPR mean for a WordPress participant in the larger community sense. Um, and I can tell you that we have spent, I've easily spent maybe three, 400 hours dealing with this over the last uh, several months. And it's something that I care about very, very deeply. Um, and it, we're trying to answer the question as holistically as possible. So if you go poking around right now on the wordpress.org site, you will see that we've got lots of information about GDPR and we anticipate doing even more. Um, so I know, for example, Automatic has been helping their WordPress.com sites uh, launch. They launched something called privacy.blog, which is part of that. Uh, and we've got lots and lots of topics that, that matter around privacy that continue to be uh, expanding on the topic of what privacy looks like. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to give some props to uh, our our collaborative space for those of you who are more technically oriented that may be curious and may want to participate. We have a GitHub uh, repo. Uh, available here at this link, github.com slash GDPR hyphen compliance slash info, where you can actually see quite a bit uh, about the, the documents we're generating, some roadmap items, some different pieces of track uh, within the wordpress.org community. And basically we're asking for the community to continue to test and give us feedback and allow us to improve this in a way that will be most helpful for everyone involved. So, Key next steps, if, if you don't necessarily fall into those categories and you're just a user of WordPress and you happen to fall into this chat and you're just curious about what this might mean, I, I say that uh, there's a couple of things here. I meant to capitalize the A in American, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Privacy is not an American concept. Let's change that. Um, so if, for those of you who don't quite understand what privacy is, it's the principle that you might, necessar might necessarily want to give everyone everything about you. Um, as a result of this, I strongly recommend that you as a user understand what data about you exists. And I recommend that you don't give it all away anymore. Uh, and if you've got things that are out there that you don't want them to don't want to exist, remove it. Or just for a sense of good cleaning, you know, it's spring. Let's just remove the data that you don't want to exist in the first place. Um, as a result, I believe that if GDPR is actually respected and, and companies respect this in a way that does the right level of detail, it might actually usher in a new era of the web, one that is more privacy focused, one that is more transparent about how data works, one that is less weird, and one that doesn't have your Cambridge Analytica's or your Equifax's, right? Potentially the data that we're collecting and giving away might be really, really dangerous and really, really messy. And whenever we see a problem, we as users need to, to pipe up. Um, there are all kinds of things that I keep discovering that really impress me, as, especially as it relates to GDPR. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to call out um, for those of you who are Chrome users. Uh, I, I came across two plugins that I really, really like, uh, one of which is called Cookie Auto Delete, and the other is called Privacy Badger. And so both of these plugins you can install on your web browser and actually help you understand what information you're giving away. Uh, there's another as well called Ghostery. All of these allow you to say, hey, data shouldn't be collected about me. And maybe I should just be removing the data that's sitting in my browser in the first place. So users should care about this in ways that are very, very deep. Uh, if you're a business, which probably is most of you who are tuning in, I recommend you understand that extraterritoriality is a real thing. And especially if you are in the European Union, understand that you probably have to follow this. Um, and you're very, very late to the game if you haven't heard about this already. Um, I would recommend every single one of you listening do an audit of the data that you have. So you can do uh, either a data privacy impact assessment or privacy impact assessment. So uh, usually a PIA is a little bit more exhaustive than a DPIA, but I recommend based on whatever you can afford, whatever time you can give, do this to understand your data. Uh, regardless of your location, do this. And anything that this audit surfaces, I recommend you refactor. You adjust and change your practices to be more risk averse, to be more conservative toward data collection. Uh, I'm all for businesses growing and becoming as best as they can, but we also have to think about long-term sustained growth. If you don't do this now and you break the rules and you get caught, you could have really, really severe punishments as a result of what you're doing. Uh, as I mentioned as well for the developers, ask this question of your team if you haven't already. Make sure you know about SSL uh, and consider 
what that means for your site and all of your services. So you need an HTTPS in front of your site address. It, it is a requirement for everything involving e-commerce. It's a requirement to meet best practices for SEO. Uh, and if you've got things that are extremely sensitive, strongly consider encryption as well. Um, I don't recommend having that sensitive data in the first place, but understand what that means and what it looks like. And simply every single time you have data that you think might be identifiable, ask for consent of that data. So this means for forms uh, and signups and anything involving that topic and look at, and if you don't have one, definitely get a privacy policy. So your privacy policy probably has some terms that say, you know, by using our site, you consent to tracking. That's probably illegal under GDPR and may actually be illegal under the United States law as well. Very, very messy stuff. Uh, but I actually say this is a good thing. This is a great thing, if anything. This is an opportunity. Um, so I want us all to, to really start to change the way that data is discussed, to change the way that data is handled, and change the way that data is collected. And so you can do sort of several things here uh, from a high level. You can start to help your clients or your users with compliance. We can build better ethics in what we do, and we can start to build trust in the web again. That's awesome, Leo. Thank you for the great presentation. There's so much uh, learning and, and good stuff in there. I really appreciate it. And I know the Lyft LMS community does as well. Um, let us know in the chat what you thought of the presentation. Um, I have a couple questions for you and we have some questions in the audience and, and feel free folks to add more questions. And if you wanna chat live and raise your hand and have a little discussion, we can do that too. Um, I'm going to start with one of my questions that relates to a question in the chat, but I was just wondering if you could riff on a little more the distinction between a controller and a processor. And the reason I bring that up is we're in WordPress, you know, there's lots of plugins and integrations. So the education entrepreneur has an online course website and you know, they, they use lifter to kind of power it up and turn it into an online school. But then we, you know, need to integrate to best and breed things like payment processors like Stripe. So could you talk through just the controller processor and what our responsibilities are and how they're different? So the most important thing you should be doing if you are collecting data about your users is understanding, asking questions and understanding. Um, this means that you need to read through the fine print. You need to have an agreement with the people that you give data to or might be processing your data with. So for example, if you're using Stripe or PayPal, they actually have these agreements available to you. If you're using a tool like MailChimp, you can actually generate an agreement right in the panel. It's all there, it's all for you. If you don't do that, you're criminally irresponsible. That's, that's, that's the law. Um, and here in the United States, in Europe, and so on and so forth. The data in which you collect is sensitive and it has serious repercussions if you don't necessarily follow the rules. Um, separating the responsibilities between a controller and a processor. So typically a controller tends to be the person who's the origin of data and the processor tends to be the third party in which the data is working with. So processors... Like Stripe, uh, Stripe would be the processor. Yes. And, and then my LMS website is, the, I'm the controller. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And depending on what services you use, you might actually have some really interesting examples of processors as well. So you're going to have your Facebooks, your Google Analytics, you're going to have YouTube possibly. If you're using YouTube embeds, they might be a processor on your site. Um, we actually have no idea how embeds, for example, are going to look uh, a few weeks from now. So technically, the way it, under a, a more conservative reading of GDPR, you can no longer have auto embeds be available. You actually would have to click on a consent button to be able to have a YouTube embed be preloaded. It's very, very extreme. So I haven't seen a single site that has taken that more conservative approach, but the law is clear. It says you need to have really, really cautious data uh, being sent out. Um, there's also a question around telemetry data, for example. like. Uh, Lifter LMS and WordPress.org, for example, might uh, be using and collecting telemetry data in ways that are messy and weird. Um, and simply the best thing to do is to understand and ask questions. So for example, if you load an image or you, uh, you call for an update, for example, that request has a round, chain, a round, uh, round trip exchange between another server and your users. And what data you give away might be really, really sensitive. So it's a messy conversation, but there's actually a, a whole long dialogue about how WordPress.org collects 
what users uh, are on your site, how many users are on your site, uh, what plugins you have, what, what version of core you're running, all that stuff WordPress.org actually has. That's important. You should understand what that means. Most users don't know. Most admins don't know. So you have to start from a place of principles. You are, you are likely, if you're running your own site, a data controller. If you are working with someone else's data, you are probably a data processor. But regardless of whether you're a processor or controller, you're equally liable for punishment under the law. Gotcha. <clears throat> um, in a similar vein, more specific example, we have a question from Tim about using chat on our websites. Like, so there's a pop-up box and somebody, you know, types in their question, perhaps drops in their email. What, what about that? Just that one on, if it's anonymous, like if it's just site visitor and we don't know who they are or whatever. I mean, some chat tools like tell you like, Oh, this person's coming in from New Hampshire or whatever. Uh, any ideas around chat specifically? So I would build in explicit consent. Uh, like in the starter of the conversation. Correct. Yeah. I would build in explicit consent. I would say, you know, by clicking yes here, I agree to give location data and email and what and whatever information you're collecting about that user and explain what that data exchange actually looks like. Um, and sometimes it gets even more innocuous. Uh, I have an example to share in just a second. Uh, there was a really fun one that I saw this morning uh, around comments. Uh, like comments on a blog post type thing? Yeah, like comments okay. on a blog post. So, so, so currently on this site, they have some text that reads, uh, and it's, this sounds pretty innocuous, but this is something that allows you to be closer to compliance than further from compliance. Um, so uh, this said, notify me of new post via email. That's what the, the box currently says. You click a little thing as you type in a comment. So what's a more appropriate GDPR version of this is I consent to having this website store my information so that I can be notified of replies. You explain what data you're collecting and for what purpose. You give scope to that information. So you have to be able to define what that vessel looks like. And you also have to manage when that uh, consent was collected and under what duress. And uh, you have to allow that user to be able to unsubscribe at any given moment. That's so awesome. a, little, a little messy, a little hard to do, but really, really cool if you think about it. But that clarification wasn't over the top. I mean, that's perfectly reasonable, you know, message to have by that type of tool. And uh, there's a really important responsibility here that I want to talk about too. Um, it segues to an idea that I think most people have a hard time grasping at. GDPR applies to everyone in your company, everyone on your website. You have to understand that we probably aren't doing it right. Um, you, Chris, and you, Thomas, and you, Kathy, and, and I can't see who's down below. Uh, all, all of you uh, matter here, right? And, and thinking about how we manage data on a day-to-day -day basis, you have to spot these kinds of things because you're gonna be dealing with this kind of information on a regular basis. And if you put information in the wrong place or if you're using, using data or think, not thinking about data in a way that is risk averse, you will ultimately allow for exposure to happen. Risk is a problem that we all have to manage. The next question uh, Kev asks is, I, I, before I state it, I think there's a sense of like overwhelm a little bit with like, oh my gosh, I have so much to do because we're all kind of starting like already in trouble, quote. Um, so he's just looking for a priority list. That's the first part of his question. For a course creator, where do we start? Is it our opt-in forms? Is it our, you know, it, the place where people enroll in our courses and buy our courses? What, what's, what's, the, what's the best place to start? I would say you need to have a privacy policy, you need SSL, you need, uh, you need to understand, you need to have data agreements, get all that stuff short up quickly. Um, I would also recommend that if you don't know how your consent works, and if you don't have a way to manage your consent with European users, you are opening yourself up to exposure, i.e. You, you are now legally uh, responsible in ways that you didn't realize before for those users uh, come Friday. So if you can't solve it by Friday, uh, you know, in many cases, it may mean shutting down registration for a brief period of time because you're dealing with some consent issues. Um, but there's also a, a bit of reality check here, which is the vast majority of sites on the internet will not be GDPR compliant by Friday. That's, that's a reality. Um, Fortune 500 companies have spent a million dollars or more each to be able to get GDPR compliant. 
um, a lot of publishers have spent upwards of six, six, seven figures as well doing this kind of work to get their sites ship shape. Um, and in reality, it's harder to do than easier. And we recognize that it's painful. So on the, on the WordPress.org side, we believe it's important that you understand that this stuff matters. You understand your biggest vulnerabilities and you start to address them. Um, data agreements matter a lot. Privacy policies matter a lot. Explicit consent matters a lot. A lot of the other stuff you can continue to sort of work on, but make sure your privacy policy is bulletproof. Make sure your explicit consent is bulletproof. Um, explicit consent's hard to get right, and it's something you're probably gonna be working on for a very long time. Accepting that as, as part of the new normal is a way to, to manage this in a way that I think is healthy. That's awesome. <laughs> um, another question that, that somebody had was just around the plugins you recommended, the browser plugins. Maybe if you just say what they are, Kathy can find them and put a link in the chat. Uh, let, let me see if I can grab them all. I mentioned Ghostery. Ghostery? Yeah. So Ghostery is awesome. Uh, and Privacy Badger. Which is made by the, the wonderful folks at the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, who deeply care about this topic. Uh, and there's one more. Uh, it was Cookie Auto Delete. Cookie Auto Delete. Great. Um, <clears throat> so I've got, I've got some screen shares that I can quickly show you guys too in case you want to see what these all look like for our users at home. Um, so this is what Ghostery looks like. Uh, Ghostery does some really powerful stuff. It actually gives you a full, I don't know if you can see my Chrome extension uh, panel here, but it actually shows you what trackers are being used on your site. Uh, Privacy Badger here, as I mentioned, is a, is a great tool built by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And it tries to ask the question, what's actually happening on your site? And it's a big project to be a little bit more user focused. And Cookie Auto Lead is really, really fun. It actually doesn't allow uh, your browser to save some of these cookies. You can set rules, you can whitelist, you can graylist, you can force all kinds of, of practices so that sites no longer collect your data illegally. So if this is a topic that matters to you as a user, I definitely say understand this. Or if you're a site and you want to understand what your site is collecting, a tool like Ghostery, for example, might be able to reveal the data that's being collected on your site. That is awesome. Um, before I go on to more listener questions, what is your recommendation for the future with opt-in forms? You know, a lot of course creators have, you know, some kind of lead magnet or a free email mini course that, you know, where they're getting to know their people and starting to teach them a few things via email. Like just opt-in form, what do you recommend? So uh, as a whole, we, we talked a little here about consents quite a bit. I recommend setting explicit consent as part of your goal. Have a checkbox that is required. And if you really need to, have a second checkbox that is required yet again. Um, explicit consent says, have your data be managed, have your data be available to your users. Give them the opportunity to make this as easy to understand as possible. So if you're doing a gated download, for example, really common lead generation practice uh, in education. So you have a little page that says, download my PDF, my white paper, my course sheet, whatever it might be. And it says, type in your thing and I'm gonna email you a copy. Please note that I'm also going to be emailing you again in the future about A, B, and C. Explain what you're doing. Be above board. You don't have to lie. In fact, lying is bad. I, I don't know if anyone ever told you this, Chris, <laughs> but lying is bad. Uh, and in fact, uh, under the law, the, the United States laws for privacy and under the European laws for privacy, lying is illegal. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, we've got a question from Tom. Uh, I'll summar summarize it in just that it's a question about the GDPR police coming to some to somebody's door in the United States, what if they're a small company, they only, they, maybe they only have a couple users in Europe, aren't they gonna go after the big fish first before they go after the little guy? So I think, I don't know if you can even answer that question, but. I can. So okay. I, I believe that this is a problem mostly for very, very large companies. So companies that are gonna make, you know, when 4% like Facebook, of, like Facebook, like Apple, like Google, like uh, Amazon, the big four, I think, are the most obvious targets. Um, the other reality is that you have all kinds of medium-sized players, uh, ad partners you'll be working with that might be part of this whole large conversation as well. But the, the, the reality is any company whose 4% is at least $20 million a year, those the companies are going to be the most uh, at risk. That being said, if you have a data breach that is serious or severe, you are liable under United States law for similar kinds of concerns. 
I believe you probably aren't a major target, but ethics is something that we can all talk about. Ethics is something we should all be trying to practice. Um, it, it's sort of like, you know, we want every building to be fire safe. And that includes your house. You know, we want that also to be the stadium to be fireproof, you know. That means you need fire lanes. You need to make sure you don't have clutter all over the place. You know, we can take the practices that apply to really, really small situations and scale them up and take situations that apply to really, really large situations and scale them down. Um, and I look at this and I say that like, Tom, you're probably not going to get sued. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really tell you. But in reality, you should recognize that it is going to be most beneficial if you understand where your exposure points are, re recognize what data you collect, and try to mitigate whatever risk you might have. Uh, a question from Tim. Uh, he's just wondering if he's, the website is not intended for people outside the United States. And so I think he's going for the, I don't need to worry about GDPR category. He's wondering if by putting something in his terms of service, saying that the website is not intended for your, anyone outside of the US, is that a solution for the, I don't have to worry about GDPR? And I just wanna add, I think, I'm not sure, but I think WP Engine may have a way to block traffic by country. And I'm sure other hosts might as well, if that's really the way you want to go. But I'll hand that over to you, Leo. I actually had a question I posted today in the GPR compliance chat about this. Um, and several people asked me about this, and uh, I'm trying to think through this question because it's, it's complicated. But if you have server-side, low-level IP processing that is lawful consented, because it is how technology has to work, it might be legal if you give a specific definition of what GDPR blocking looks like, if you have some information around that. But that being said, it is very, very hard to do accurately. GOIP tracking is still what, like 97, 98% successful. So you still have a risk category that may happen. You also have some interesting use cases of people using VPNs and people who uh, might be on a managed network that may have a different kind of IP set, set up for DNS. You have examples of people who may get sidestepped through your tools. Um, that being said, I believe trying to avoid GDPR and avoid the ethical conversation is the wrong way forward. I believe it's better to think about data. I think it's better to think about consent. I think it's better to try to mitigate your risk period and collect less data to begin with to avoid having problems. Thank you. Uh, and Peter has some comments about how uh, he, we've had conversations about how business models need to be redesigned and that, that following old list building strategies are, are not the way to go. Um, and just it can be a huge business advantage to the customers that treat them with respect. So uh, maybe you could just speak to that at an emotional level. I think there's a lot of fear that we've done all these things to build our email list because the money is in the list uh, in this world where our list is not going to be as big because we're asking for consent in all these places. How do you, can you tell me, can you tell me uh, some advice? Yeah. So the most extreme example I've seen in the wild uh, is the team Manchester United, uh, the number one soccer team in Europe, maybe depending on who you ask. Don't ask me I'm an American uh, and they call it football, but uh, <laughs> They, they decided that their list was so fuzzy, their customers were so loyal that they took the most extreme strategy I've seen in the wild. They actually said, <laughs> this is debatable. <laughs> <laughs> there are uh, Europeans here. <laughs> I know. I, uh, my good friends all like the FC Barcelona and you know, whatever. <laughs> there's, there's different opinions. Uh, so Manchester United actually decided that their loyalty was so strong and the risk was so high that they said, let's re-opt in every single person. So they had a huge emotional campaign. They had their top soccer players all, you know, saying, hey, if you really care about, you know, your team, re-sign up. So they went, they went to the extreme measures to get rid of all of the old data that might have questionable consent and reset. That's probably more extreme than most people need to go. But if people love your brand or know you and, and respect you, you'd be surprised at what levels of engagement that might actually look like. And you know, from a, from a business management perspective and from a list building perspective, having smaller lists with higher levels of engagement means you have higher success rates, which means it, it's better to grow with. You have less cruft you're dealing with. Um, it means that you're more likely to show off how good you're doing. So 
I believe it may be a good time to take some pruning to your, to your lists. Um, I, I can think about strategies that I've worked with companies in the past that have removed lists that, or removed people from lists that were underperforming, that didn't click on anything for a year, for example. Um, if you're holding on to data that you don't need to be holding on to, that's actually exposure. Um, Google Analytics, MailChimp, Facebook now all have tools to be able to remove users who haven't been part of your data set for a long time and to remove that level of exposure because it matters. Um, and from a list building perspective, like you need to get rid of the stuff that is going to give you problems. So does that answer the question, do you think? I think it does. I think it does. And uh, we've got a few more questions here and then we're going to shift over to the Lyft LMS side of things. Amy is asking for basically an email list tool recommendation. She's just getting started. I can just speak from my own personal experience. I'm an active campaign user. I really like all the information they've provided around GDPR and, um, you know, I'm, I respect what they're doing. So it's hard to, you know, that's like a big question. I don't, I don't have a way to play favorites, you know, active campaigns, big MailChimp's big convert kit is big. Um, I mean, those are some of the top, email tools that I see people using in the Lyft LMS ecosystem. There's a, there's a more startup one called mail or light. It's not really a startup anymore, but a lot of people are you know starting to use that. What about you? What any thoughts? I, I, I don't have, I'm not sponsored. I'm not a corporate shill by anyone. Um, I do know that MailChimp sponsors national public radio. So I like them for that. Um, I also think that they've led uh, a lot of innovation in the email, email space. Um, they came up with some really smart email templates and, uh, and I believe that they've actually been one of the leaders in talking about GDPR in the email space. So for that, for that, for that reason alone, uh, or those reasons alone, I would say MailChimp is probably my first suggestion, but there are lots of reasons why you wouldn't use MailChimp, uh, including for example, they charge per subscriber, which is expensive for certain organizations. But like we just said, you probably have too many subscribers if you're worrying about what you're paying for them. Awesome. And then a couple of quick uh, speculation questions from Tim, <laughs> and these have to do with, do you think there might be a, a problem with plaintiff attorneys filing serial lawsuits with serial plaintiffs? Is that coming in the horizon? And the other uh, speculation question into the future that he's asking us just to weigh in on is, will this put email list brokers out of business or under the table? You know, when you, because there are places you can go to buy an email list of, you know, real estate agents in Nevada or whatever, There's, or, or people using certain software tools, these things exist. Well, and we talked a little bit, you know, very, very briefly about um, lookalike targeting uh, in the presentation. I didn't go into detail, but this is a, a common technique for Facebook and AdSense, right? You can, you can create different kinds of queries that might get at specific kinds of people to be able to surface results that might be able to bring in business. Those tools are a lot smarter. I would recommend that if I were to be investing my money, I'd be going there in the first place. Um, email list brokers are evil human beings and I really hope that they disappear from the face of the, the space. Uh, I, I talked about this a couple times too, about the correction to inflated marketing levels. Like, again, I'm, I'm taking a very, uh, specific perspective. So, so mind that, but we have had far too much growth in ways that are unhealthy and unsustainable. And GDPR tries to correct a lot of this too, because a lot of that happened as a result of illegal data collection, illegal data use, illegal data reuse, illegal data processing. And I believe it's better to sort of take a couple steps back. Um, in regard to serial lawsuits, that's a really, really complicated question. Um, I do know that in the European Union, they have staged and, and prepared already dozens and dozens and dozens of lawsuits. Um, and in fact, part of the things that led to GDPR, uh, the specific nuances, for example, like the right to be forgotten, came, came about as a result of a Google AdWords uh, campaign uh, in Spain, if I'm not, mis not mistaken. And you'd be surprised at the details in which these companies are willing to fight to try to not be ethical. Um, I'm of the mindset that like, I want to work with these companies and come up with the best way moving forward. I want us to have opt-in as part of what we do. That's awesome. Well, Leo, I've, I really want to thank you. This is, I've seen a lot of information on GDPR and this is the best presentation I personally have seen on it. And thank you for, you know, bringing it to the Lyft LMS community, our corner of the internet here and making it relevant and answering our questions. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do that. For those of you in the audience, let's give Leo some love in the chat and um, yeah, and stay tuned because we're going to get into the Lyft LMS side of things here. Leo, I know you have a lot going on. Feel free to hang out if you have time, if you need to jump, it's okay. I'll be hanging um, out for a few just in case there's any more questions, especially as it relates to the stuff that Thomas is about to show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll, we'll hand it over to you, Thomas. And 
I just want to say, as we kick, get over deeper into GDPR and the Lyft LMS world, one of our core driving philosophy has always been about you, like you're our customer, you are our user. But what we also uh, hold in our highest regard is our customer's customer. That's your customer. And this data, their experience of taking your course, their experience of buying your course, their experience of data privacy and freedom. If we take care of your customer's customer, everybody wins. And that's been a part of how we approach the Lyft LMS project from the from the very beginning so th this gdpr kind of shines a light on that of our approach there and i'd also just like to speak a little bit to the the fear and the anxiety and the overwhelm around all this um I, if we focus on courses that work and are engaging and have great content and create a learning transformation out in the real world that's the best marketing there ever is. You know, having a big email list with a 10% open rate, if I could choose between, you know, a 100,000 person email list with 10% 10, 10 open rate or a course that 90% of the people that go through it get the result that the marketing of the course promises, I'm going to place my bet on the great course and the great instructional exper experience design that I've created and delivered through the wonderful tools of WordPress and Lyft LMS and all my other sub processors like PayPal and Stripe and, and whatever. <clears throat> so I, I'm, what I'm saying is uh, I, there is a lot of fear and anxiety out there, but I think the world is changing like Peter mentioned. And, you know, having a big email list is not as important as having a great learning experience that gets real world results. And my, my general advice is to just focus on making your course so good that, and your, your membership or your whatever the stack is of training that you create uh, just to be so good, they can't ignore you. So Thomas, over to you. See, can we hear? Yes, we can hear now. Yeah. Um, so we're going to do a quick tour through, and thank you again, Leo. Um, that just, I'll echo everything that Chris said. Um, I think I'm sharing the wrong screen. Am I sharing the wrong screen? What am I sharing here? We don't have your video yet. Um, yeah, it's not letting me turn it on. I think we're hitting that, um, uh, no worries. that two host limit there. So it's not letting me turn video on. Um, I look unshaven and unkempt as usual. Uh, <laughs> uh, so nothing oh, too exciting there. Um, but we can see my screen, right? We're seeing the, the WordPress dashboard and, um, we're just going to do a quick tour through some of the, um, you know, I, I want to cover two things. I want to cover one. Uh, what the WordPress core has added um, because this is there's some things that uh, your plugins can do for you and there's some things your plugins can't do for you um, and, and I think it's important to understand how all this stuff works um, and a lot of this relies on stuff that you know Leo has been part of in the WordPress core um, you know I, I think a relatively small team of developers has worked really really hard to champion this um, and, and, and get functions built into the WordPress core so that we can all, as plugin developers and then as pl and plugin users, um, you know, kind of utilize all this stuff and become compliant. Um, and yeah, maybe more importantly, just become more ethical um, as business owners. So, um, so I wanna show kind of some of those core functions and then I'll talk about how Lyft or LMS is going to integrate into those core functions to make it possible to um, kind of make, make good on all these things that GDPR wants us to make good on. Um, so yeah, uh, on Thursday of last week, WordPress 4.9.6 was released. Shortly thereafter, we released Lifter LMS um, 3.18, uh, which uh, integrates with 4.9.6. Um, and when you load up 4.9.6, you'll see this little privacy message, which uh, orients us to some new privacy tools, um, which are gonna be found under tools. Uh, let me just miss that message. Uh, you'll see tools, you'll be able to export personal data and erase personal data. Um, so what Leo was talking about, there's the right to portability, there's the right to erasure. I forget what the other word you said there was, right to something else, or right to be forgotten, maybe. Um, right to be forgotten. Right to be forgotten. So those are going to be our two ins uh, to allow our users, if you're using Lyft or LMS, we'll call them students, um, our students to both uh, get their data, port that out of your WordPress database and into their hands. Um, and then if they want to be removed, allow you to easily remove all that data from the website um, so that they're no longer a student or user of your website. Um, and the other important thing is going to be found under the WordPress general settings here. Uh, nope, sorry, WordPress reading settings. Where did they put that? Uh, oh, sorry, it's just under privacy. 
So yep. own menu item under privacy. Um, and this uh, is just kind of an interface into creating a new page, which you can configure as your privacy policy page, uh, quote unquote. Um, I think one of the really cool thing they've done is they've given a way for plugin developers like us, um, like WooCommerce, like anybody, uh, Gravity Forms or Ninja Forms who's collecting data to hook into a like uh, example privacy policy and help us expose the data we collect so that you as the site owner, the person using this plugin, uh, has a really, really clear idea of what kind of data you're collecting. Um, we, again, are not your legal counselor here. We're going to tell you what we're collecting using Lifter LMS, um, or rather what Lifter LMS collects for you into your website. Um, but ultimately, you need to consult with lawyers to figure out exactly what the language of your pri privacy policy needs to be. Um, but this gives us a really simple in into creating one of those. So um, if, you, if you already had a privacy policy on this little sample website I spooled up, we don't have one. Um, but you could create a new privacy policy page and it loads you up here um, and it pre-fills it with a bunch of example data for you. Um, this all comes from the WordPress core. You can look through this. You don't want to press publish right now um, because this is not a real privacy policy. This is an example privacy policy that you, again, are going to want to work with some legal counsel to fill in all your information on. Um, this other cool thing we, they put together um, is the privacy policy guide. And this is how plugins like Lyft or LMS um, the WordPress core, WooCommerce, so on and so forth, are going to be able to provide you with information on what kind of data is collected by that plugin. Um, so if you bump down to Lifter LMS here, you'll see there's sample language um, about what Lifter LMS is gathering, collecting, what it's doing with it. Um, and you could use this as a starting point for creating your privacy policy on your Lifter LMS powered website. You can simply copy it, come back over to your privacy policy and paste it in here. Um, some of this is going to show up as yellow. That's stuff that you're, you're going to want to delete before you publish it, obviously. Um, but it, it kind of gives you a, a primer and outline on, on what's going on with Lifter LMS, what kind of data is being collected, and why. Um, so if we publish that, um, we'll now have a privacy policy on our site. This doesn't automatically put that anywhere. It's up to you now to add that to your footers, to your menus, wherever you want to put it. Um, but we've added a couple other features, too. Um, in previous versions of Lifter LMS, you might be familiar with the ability to add a terms and conditions page to your website. Um, in addition to that, now you'll have the privacy policy page. Um, so now this is automatically pre-selected because you created it through that WordPress interface. Um, this privacy policy exists now. Um, and in an effort to help with that um, explicit consent uh, that you heard Leo talk about, you now have the opportunity to very easily customize a message um, that's going to output anywhere Lifter LMS collects data. That would be on enrollment forms, registration forms, checkout forms. This message can be customized and will be output with a link to your privacy policy page. Um, so if we look at this is what Lifter LMS would have looked like pre-privacy policy. You'll just have enrollment confirmation, um, just a standard checkout form for a free course. Um, there's no real information here about what we're doing with the data or why. Maybe you have a privacy policy and it's in your footer already, but at the, at the, at the time with which this uh, student is checking out, they haven't actually read that privacy policy or being notified it. But now after we update to 3.9.6 and create our privacy policy, we can refresh the page uh, and we'll have the personal privacy policy message there um, and you can customize that to say whatever you want. Um, and again, this is something that, this is stock language. Um, you're gonna wanna customize this to, to match your brand, to match the data you're actually collecting. One thing that's important to note that Lifter LMS doesn't know what other plugins you have installed. Um, we don't know what your other plugins are doing. We don't claim to. So uh, if you have, you know, the average site probably has 20 plugins installed and all of those might be doing different things with personal data. Um, if you have add-ons that add custom fields or something like that, you might be collecting data that Lifter LMS doesn't cover by default in our default language. So again, you're going to need to understand what your site is doing, uh, why it's doing it, how you're doing it, and modify your, your language to, uh, to suit your actual circumstances. Um, but that's just one thing. Uh, in addition, if you have a terms and conditions page, uh, we'll just select, oh, here we go, I already have one. Um, this will allow that explicit consent by adding a checkbox. Um, we're calling it the terms and conditions. You can call it whatever you want. Again, if we name this page something else, um, that would show up. But if we add a terms and conditions, that will add the privacy policy, which they have to explicitly consent to. Um, and again, maybe we should change our default language after listening to Leo's presentation here. But um, you know, you might want to adjust your default language for that explicit consent message. 
um, to be maybe um, a little bit more, uh, I don't know, along the lines of maybe some of the examples that Leo gave. But anyway, uh, you now have all the tools to do that. Um, and previously, I mean, you already had these terms and conditions things, but now you can again customize the language very easily without having to be a developer or write any code or customize any templates. Um, just go into your settings and adjust it. Uh, you've got a little merge code to merge in the, the link so that users can very easily get to that page um, without having to do anything fancy. Um, so those will, again, that will display anytime Lifter LMS is enrolling your users, um, collecting all of this data that we see here. Um, so that, that's kind of one, one side of this. Um, and uh, the next side is, is how to actually handle these right to erasures, these right to portabilities. Um, and what to do there. And this is maybe the bigger portion. Um, this gets more into what the WordPress core has done. Um, and I'm just gonna walk through a couple sample import, uh, exports and erasures um, because there's several steps here. Um, all of them are kind of important. Um, and uh, this is something that you might want to explain in your privacy policy, um, how if a user wants to gain access to all of their personal data to an export, um, like what is the process gonna look like for them um, and WordPress hasn't really defined uh, any methods or any, any, any perfect solutions for that, but mainly somebody is going to email you or contact you somehow, maybe submit a contact form, request their data. Um, and when they do, they're gonna give you their, their email address. So um, I just have a lot of sample data loaded up into this site. So let's just take this guy. Um, I'm gonna get his email address. This is all fake data. It might be a real name, but it is a fake person. Um, this isn't a real website. Um, but so let's just say D Justin sent me an email and said, I want a copy of all my data. Um, you as your admin would log in, you go to your export, export personal data uh, and you would submit the request and it will now create a new uh, data export request. Uh, it's gonna send an email to Justin. That way Justin can confirm that the request is real. Um, it's gonna send it to his email address. That way we know somebody's not, uh, you know, uh, phishing for personal data by just submitting random email addresses or something like that. So the, the Justin is going to actually have to confirm this. Uh, since this is not a real website, I've just got a mail logger on here so we can actually view what those emails look like. Um, and it kind of formats it a little bit weird, but it's just a plain text email that comes out of WordPress uh, with a link where Justin can uh, confirm the request. So he'll come in and he'll say, thank you for requesting the export. Um, and as my admin again, I'll now see that the, the, the request has been confirmed uh, and I can very simply just email the data right to Justin. Um, so this will now compile all of the data that your WordPress website has on Justin. So that's gonna include name, um, all the custom information that he would have filled out here from Lifter LMS, like their uh, first name, last name, address, email, um, city, state, zip, all that kind of stuff, phone number, if you have that configured. Um, as well as a lot of other information like their progress through various courses, certificates they've earned, achievements they've earned, quizzes they've taken, um, uh, purchases they've made, so on and so forth. Um, so now they, they get just a dump of everything about them that you have on their website. Uh, whoops, so let me refresh that. We'll see this next email. So this is the email that Justin will get with all that data. Um, again, it'll just be a link where they can grab that and download that data file. If you notice the name is um, kind of weird, there's a lot of random characters in there and that's, uh, that's obscurity through, uh, or security through obscurity, so you can't just guess the email, uh, the, the names of these files um, if you're somebody other than Justin. So if we just download that, we'll see, uh, let's see. So I downloaded a copy of that, that's gonna give you a little zip file. Um, in that is going to be an HTML file, which you can open in any browser. And this is what the personal data export looks like. Um, this stuff at the top all comes from the WordPress core. And as we get down to the bottom, this is all information that is gathered by Lifter LMS. Um, so you'll see IP address, which is something that um, we gather during checkout um, for order histories and things like that. Um, if this user had actually purchased something, we'd see some orders, uh, you would see quizzes, so on and so forth. There's a lot of data. Basically every piece of information that Lifter LMS has gathered about a customer, uh, a student at some point will be exported here. Um, and, and you can see all that stuff here uh, in, in this data export. Um, and there's other things too. If this user had commented on a course or a lesson or something like that, if you have the social learning add-on, um, it would give you a list of all of their social learning timeline posts and things like that. Um, anything they've uploaded, um, they'll have access to that. 
Um, so it's basically everything you need to know. Um, if you want a full exhaustive list of all that data, what's included, what's exported, um, check out our privacy documentation. I think Kathy could probably drop a link into the chat. Um, there's a getting started guide that covers everything you need to know about these new privacy features in Lifter LMS. Um, so that's how the export works. And the, um, the erasure um, is very similar. The, you'll, you'll notice when we go to the erasure screen, it's the exact same interface, only it says erase as opposed to export. Um, so if I went in here and I did, oh, that's not the right one. That's not the right one either. If I paste his email, we'd go through a similar process. Um, it would send him a new email asking him to erase. Uh, I think this part's very important. There's no coming back from here. So we definitely want to make sure your customers, your students are um, real before we erase their data. Because once you erase it, you erase it. Um, of course, you could always get it back, I suppose, if you had a backup. Excuse me, but um, but it is important to note that this is a final step that we don't have an undo function here that would kind of defeat the whole purpose of doing this. Um, that raises a question in my mind, Leo: is how do we consider a backup with regards to erasing personal data from a website? That my, my friend is a hundred thousand dollar question. Okay, yeah, it's something that I literally never considered until this moment. I was just like, oh, there's a backup. It, uh, it is do, the first time I've considered it. Uh, so yeah. this is actually a really big deal for a lot of different sites. So for a variety of reasons, they've factored in a couple of different kinds of questions to this problem. You know, uh, do we have some way, for example, to store a log of uh, data requests, whether they be exports or erasure? Uh, and you almost have to, right? Uh, and there's also, this is a really messy question, and I'm just going to let it sit because I don't have a good answer for it, but I want to share it because it's a really good one. Um, and one of the parts where GDPR falls apart that I really love to talk about because it's messy is in the worst case scenario, say I am upset with you, Thomas, you sell widgets for a living and you've mishandled my data. And I say, give me a copy of all my data. And you say, okay, here's all, all your data. And I say, Thomas, erase all my data and you erase all my data. And then I go to the local courts and I say, I have a copy of all my data here and Thomas was a bad person. Look how awful he was. And now suddenly you no longer have all that data to be able to go to court and talk and discuss through that information. So there's a couple places that we don't quite understand yet around erasure and exports and logging of that information. And I really, really hope that clarity in law and enforcement is gonna be able to talk about this, um, especially in the case of backups, for example, right? We know that uh, in a given backup scenario, you no longer want to have your user as part of your information. Um, it's a messy topic and it's one that I don't think we've found a good answer to yet, um, but it's something that nearly every single host uh, out there is trying to solve because it matters. Yeah, I'm just nodding because I, I, you can't see me nodding, but um, <laughs> yeah, there's still questions, huh? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a good question though, and it's one that we should be asking and, and trying to, to get at. And even though GDPR falls apart in a couple of places, it's something that I think asks and begs a really, really good question. Um, because if someone says, I no longer want my information to be as part of your data set, you have to respect it. Yeah. Um, Tim asked an interesting question that says, what about governmental organization requires that, uh, that requires continuing education contact info be stored forever? Uh, and another potential example of that is there's tax implications of removing order data um, and, and purchase information and things like that. So in higher education, um, they have uh, disclosure laws that actually say how long you're going to keep the data and for what purpose. So typically these things are published in catalogs. I would say, you know, consider approaching the conversation that way, where you define the parameters of the vessel. You say the data that we have will be kept for this long, and after you unenroll, it'll be removed after this time, and actually do that work, right? You know, you don't necessarily need to hold on to the data forever. Understand the definitions of what that looks like. Um, and one of the ways Lifter LMS is going to help you do that is uh, if, for example, you need to retain order information, um, or you need to retain what we're going to bulk uh, call LMS data, which will be information about their enrollments, their quizzes, their progress, uh, so on and so forth. Um, there's a set of settings here under Lifter LMS settings accounts where you can um, opt to retain order data um, or student LMS data during these account ratio requests. So that would essentially mean that um, when you remove an order, uh, the student's data would be removed from the order. So like name and personal information would be removed, but you'd still have um, you'd, you'd essentially have an anonymous order that uh, you can retain for your tax records so that you know you um, 
you, you made that order. So your, your bookkeeping and records don't get all messed up. Um, same thing with LMS data. So you can remove everything about the student with the exception of their progress. So you'd still have a shell of that student's data um, in there. These things are both disabled by default. And that means that during an erasure, order data and student LMS data will not be removed from the website. Um, but other information will be removed from the website about that and student. Um, so, uh, and we're going to leave that up to you. Uh, you guys, you, you need to determine with your lawyer, with whatever, uh, you know, if you're accredited by some institution um, and they have their own special regulations and guidelines, um, you need to retain that data for your purposes. Um, and, and that's up to you. We're just giving you the tools to do it. Um, but another interesting thing I, I've been finding in, in the work I've been doing and looking at how other plugins are working, how other companies are working that are not WordPress plugins, but are just on the web, um, just SaaS prop platforms and things like that, um, is, uh, like Leo just said, disclosing that data. Like if you need to retain order data for five years or whatever the length it is before, um, so for, for audit reasons or something like that, um, you can disclose that you are going to be retaining order data for five years or something along those lines. Um, purchase data, uh, student progress on your um, your courses and memberships and things like that. So, uh, uh, A really common example of, of this, what it might look like in a uh, higher education environment, uh, which is what I'm most familiar with, is that, for example, the SIS might be storing final grade data and the LMS might store course progress data. But oftentimes in higher ed, they actually wipe out all of the course progress on a semester basis. So they're, they're trying to keep that data set as uh, risk averse as possible because they believe that breaching uh, course information is very, very risky. Uh, and even in some environments, for example, you can't see your classmates, um, you can't see progress on an average. A lot of the features that seem pretty uh, important to LMS may actually be uh, vulnerabilities. And so it's, it's really interesting to see how higher education approaches it because it means that data is extremely, extremely sensitive. And final progress might be important externally, but uh, internal progress that finds an LMS may not be. Hmm. Um, crazy. So, uh, so then during the, the data removal, um, well, I'll skip going through the whole process, but you'll also notice that both during the erasures and the exports, you can force that personal data um, so if you as a, you know, um, if you just want to download that for your own records or something like that, or if um, you just want to remove data because um, somebody's not confirming the email or I don't know, something for whatever reason you want, uh, you can just erase that data um, and that user will be gone. It'll give you a little output of what data was removed. Um, so you'll see here all this Lifter LMS data was removed, their IP address, their phone number, um, certificates, uh, notifications, so on and so forth. Um, and if we go look back at our student, we'll see that now a lot of his information is gone. Um, we retain his e name and his email. Um, the reason for that is that data is actually stored in the WordPress database. Um, these are under uh, like WordPress core tables. Um, and then the final step for actually fully removing a user from your website would be to go in and, and physically delete that user. Um, so that, that step does not get covered during that data erasure. Um, and that final step is up to you to remove your, your, your user, uh, determine if you want to retain any of that content. Um, with a student, they're not going to have any content because they don't create any posts or anything like that. Um, but then you would delete your user and it'd be completely gone from your website and forgotten. It's, it's a weird technicality, but under WordPress's stack of how users are, are defined, requesting your user data to be removed is separate from requesting from your user account to be removed. Oh, that's a, okay. I, I, I posed this question in the GDPR thing right around deadline. Um, and I, I got a very short answer that wasn't as clear as that. So that, um, that helps me understand a little bit better. So, so that would be, yeah. So, so can you, can you say that again though, please? So technically requesting your information to be removed and asking for your account to be closed are two separate requests, but I would anticipate nine times out of 10, if not 99 times out of a hundred, you probably should just delete the account too. I think I would tend to agree with that, yeah. No. But uh, understanding there's a difference, right? So you might, you might, especially in the case of uh, a formal education, you might have other requirements to hold on to that user account. Uh, it's just a matter of understanding your vertical or understanding your rules, um, whether this is uh, an accreditation type thing or non-accreditation type thing. There's all kinds of other considerations. There, there, I could think of a really uh, simple use case for, for having those separate uh, on a Lifter LMS site would be if, you have, if you're using social learning, you have somebody that wants to disappear from the social learning side of things. They no longer want their posts to be public. They want all that stuff removed. 
but they still want to retain their account on their site. They still are interested in, in taking your courses and those kind of things. They just want to opt out of the social side. You could remove their personal data, um, leave their LMS data in there and, and retain the account so that they can continue, can continue taking your courses. Um, I don't know if that will ever happen, but there's a, there's a scenario that just crossed my mind. Um, so I think that covers everything. Um, everything we've done. Uh, if you, if you follow along with any release notes and things that have been going on in the last week, um, we're working on also updating all of our add-ons, um, to, uh, convert kit. Our, our convert kit add-on came out on Friday. I think maybe it was, yeah, I think it was Friday. Um, that adds some explicit consent where you used to just automatically add users to your ConvertKit sequences and start tagging them as subscribers and things like that. We will now have explicit consent um, in addition to everything else where there's an easy um, checkbox for, for opting into the mailing list side of things that ConvertKit does. Um, we're almost finished with updating our feature set for MailChimp, our MailChimp add-on. Um, so on and so forth. And I, I think we have one more set of data that we need to add an exporter for um, from Lifter LMS private areas that we'll, you, you'll see before Friday. Um, but uh, I think that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions on any of these, these features or settings or more questions for Leo since he's still here? Yeah, let us know in the Q&A if anybody has any questions, Lifter specific. If anybody wants to talk live, feel free to raise your hand. Let's see here. Any hands up? <clears throat> well, I, I want to thank you all for coming on this call and spending this time with us. Any further questions? We are going to be, you know, posting this. We we uh, you know make our webinars freely freely available forever. So there's a link at the bottom of the Lifter LMS website where this will show up. Uh, an area called webinars. Leo, yeah, somebody had asked for a copy of your slides. Would you be comfortable posting those or sharing those with us for anybody who wants them? I haven't quite got them ready yet, but I actually okay. plan on releasing them on GitHub uh, under GPL. Uh, so they'll probably be like a markdown file type thing. Um, since I actually feel quite strongly about releasing this as an open source uh, thing, because I know that even in my attempts to get things right, there are details that I probably have gotten wrong or maybe incompletely. It's every time I, I do this talk, and I've done it, I think now five or six times, and I'm doing it two or three more times on top of this. Uh, it's something that I think, you know, I want people to continue to refine, especially as the law changes its enforcement and continues to be refactored. So once that's uh, final, I can share it on with you guys and you can share it out to your community. Will do. Thank you. That's awesome. <clears throat> and Amy and the question is just throwing a virtual cuddle Thomas's way because Thomas has helped her out when she was on the verge of tears. Um, that's just a, you know, a support shout out. Thank you for the kind words, Amy. Appreciate Thank you. That. It's nothing to cry about here. This is all working <laughs> through this stuff together. Thomas is a brilliant technologist. We're really lucky uh, to be with him on the journey with Lifter LMS. And uh, yeah, Leo, Thomas, thank you for your leadership on this issue. This is really good stuff. It feels great to, uh, you know, just raising the conversation to, you know, not having the biggest list, but having the best course and, and you know, really fighting for our, our end users and their freedom uh, for data privacy and, and, and freedom and that, that kind of thing. So thank you everybody for coming and um, we'll be sending out a replay on this if you want to rewatch it. And I hope everybody has a great rest of your day.